I'll just, I'd like to, um, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the Muskogee and Cherokee peoples and their ancestors who um, curated and cared for this land that we're visiting uh, today. Um, and also acknowledge the uh, many people who are violently uh, uh, taken from their homes and brought here to work and shape this land that we're um, so lucky to be uh, experiencing here at the conference. Also my gratitude to Cassie and the other people who organized the meeting. Let's see here. My, uh, the slideshow's being, being resistant, but I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, thank you for your help. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Janelle Baker and, and, um, my friend and colleague Bill Snow is going to, uh, join me in a moment. And I know that you'd all rather hear him speak. So I'm going to try to be, uh, brief, uh, but I'm a, I'm a cultural and anthropologist and ethnobiologist, uh, uh, at Athabasca University, which is in the northern part of what is now known as Alberta in Western Canada. Um, and uh, the, I've been coming to these meetings for a while. So those of you that know me know that I've worked a lot in the oil sands and Treaty 8 region around concerns with wild food contamination. But I actually uh, was raised on a on a small subsistence type farm uh, on the borders of Treaty 6 and Treaty 7, which is where I stay now, um, which is the area that I'm talking about today and the area that Bill and his ancestors come from. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about fish, which is a bit of a change for me. So this, I just wanted to show a few maps to help orient where, where, where I'm talking about. So you can see that it's Northwest of Calgary, Alberta um, in the Rockies uh, region. Oh, and I was going to mention, sorry, that when, about my um, research in Northern Alberta on, on bush people's concerns about bush food contamination and food sovereignty. Uh, my master's student, Megan Lindholm, who's here, will be speaking about that tomorrow afternoon if you're curious to know what's going on in those projects. Um, so yeah, and so this map is showing, uh, uh, it's a, a government planning region that's called the Bighorn region. And so the reason that this, the way that this work sort of came to me was that my friend and colleague, Métis anthropologist Zoe Todd, who does a lot of work on fish and is creating a fish institute as a Canada research chair, um, she came to me with this grant that was for high risk, early career researchers, high risk, high reward. And it was a time in, in a political context that this was a highly contested area that was being used in a political uh, election. Um, and so she, and she had these family connections to it. Her late stepfather had been a fisheries biologist in this region who had fought a lot, um, for the, um, uh, sort of protection of bull trout and designation of them as a threatened species. And so she said, like, I had, the, had a dream, you know, we should do this fish, you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, okay, like, I, I, I live right here. And then um, through another friend, I've known Bill for years, or through another friend told me, Bill has this project on cutthroat trout, you should talk to him. Like, within a week, we were at a meeting on ethics, uh, ironically, by the Alberta government, and um, said, hey, Bill, I want to do this. And he's like, yeah. And so, and this has grown into another project that I'll present maybe in the future on um, Stony Nakoda women's uh, concerns and knowledge about selenium from coal mines and their food supply. So I'm still, you can't get me away from uh, the food contaminants, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, you know... Um, a uh, close up of the region that we're talking about today. So that black and white or the black and red area is a place that in English is known as Pinto Lake. Um, and you can see um, the Klein River leading down towards an area um, that would be David Thompson country if anyone's familiar with the region. But this would be, um, uh, if anyone knows Banff uh, National Park and Jasper, sort of partway through the Saskatchewan River crossing and east from there. Um, but you can also see on the Klein River, and well, it's actually the North Saskatchewan River and Highway 11 uh, is what is called Abraham Lake. And that this is a dam. This is a man-made dam. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's heavily affected the habitat and traditional inherent rights of Stony Nakoda peoples um, uh, to end their treaty, their inherent treaty rights to um, access this area. We could do an entire... Um, talk on that. Um, and so uh, I just want to share a video. Thank 
So Pinto Lake is a, a translation from, from Stony language. So in our language, we say Shunahnamne, meaning Pinto Lake. And it also has another name, Hahashidopta Imne. So those are two names that that this lake has. Pinto Lake Hawaiian is what? How? Just they respect. It's a keep his keep his hidden. How? We don't have Mitogashi. Hm, so that's when we come out here and do a lot of fishing. Just to fish overnight. All night. Well, every five minutes the fish will be all going downstream. Then they'll rust back, back into the lake. They keep doing that all night long. We, we carry flashlights. That's why some of these elders, they say they made fires both sides of this creek here. It was an awesome experience to, to see, see these old yeah. guys showing us how it's done. It's like, oh, wow. They passed the knowledge. Yes. You yeah, and, they passed and your them. brothers. Yeah. Now it was a lot of fun. At that time, we came on horseback, and uh, it took us about three days to just, we just rode in, and it, it was um, really, um, I guess, good for the soul just to come out and spend time out here with my father. That's the only people that role they were given didn't have access here after this became a country of Canada. But now today, we are back here and reconnected. And I'm hoping this will continue as how Creator has given us through the protocols to survive. Same time, take care of Mother Earth as she have taken care of us. It's news. Thank you. It's no coincidence that the that Abraham Lake that I just mentioned um, is named for Abraham. Um, as you can see, several of the elders they talked about were last name had the last name of Abraham. So, um, and and the elder that you see, uh, it was his grandfather Silas that lived in that area that the that the man made lake was created. So, as you heard Barry talk about protocol, um, you know, as researchers, we've been. Um, uh, it's been necessary for us to follow proper protocols, so we've attended uh, many ceremonies and meetings um, uh, about the project. And you can say we've we've gone on several trips, but the Pinto Lake trip that you see in the video was sort of the culmination. I did go, yeah, the one of the young guys I went with, that uh, him and another guy uh, hiking up the Klein River. After that, you know, up to the area that elders, you know, were unable to go do to have a look around and they're hockey players no one warned me that they were so fit before I went but it was great um so just a really quick mention of bull trout we've been talking about them I haven't described what they are they're uh sal salvinius confluentus they're actually not a trout they're a char or a salmonid um and they they require cold water they're a cold freshwater fish that stream you saw is where they spawn they need that gravelly bed and really cold, clear water, but they also need areas that will be in one of Bill's slides that have a lot of uh, tree coverage and play and like nooks in the bank to um, uh, for them to hide. Oh, I'm Bill. Before you start, I just want to note that Bill is the acting director of consultation for the Stony uh, Tribal Council, and I want to acknowledge his uh, late father, Chief John Snow, who wrote the book. These mountains are our sacred places, the story of stony people. It's a great reference. 
Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Ishniesh. Ambo uh, Stej, good day. Uh, just wanted to say also uh, thank you to Emory uh, University uh, for the land acknowledgement and also the welcoming by the Sco Muscogee Creek uh, people to be here. It's it's such a beautiful place and, and my first time to this part of part of the states. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the methodology that we've been using uh, here. Uh, the methodology has been derived from a study done uh, further uh, earlier. Uh, that is the uh, uh, bison cultural study, the reintroduction of bison back in, back into Banff National Park. Um, that methodology came about, and we described it in the report. Uh, that's on a uh, a separate uh, project. What I wanted to touch on briefly is the reason why we had to develop a methodology is because there's a lot of differences when we talk about Western science and traditional knowledge. Uh, I won't go through many of them, but just to draw out a few, maybe the ones that uh, we've heard in some of our discussions today. Um, in much of Western science is based on a linear or a time-based understanding of phenomena or nature. In traditional knowledge, we are more focused on story. What is the story of this area? What is the story of this wildlife? What is, how does that story relate to people or in special instances that have happened in the past? So that's the dominant feature rather than how much time we have left in a presentation. Uh, <laughs> the other, the other uh, uh, really important aspect of traditional knowledge versus versus Western science is how knowledge is derived. Uh, in Western science, you have a scientific method that's repeated where you take out, you extract information from nature. In traditional knowledge, we gather nature by going to ceremonies. The spirit tells us what that knowledge is. It imparts that knowledge to us as indigenous people. So that is a whole process in itself that comes through years of years of understanding. Uh, whereas Western science knowledge might be compiled in a report, it becomes static. Traditional knowledge is not just the knowledge, but the role and responsibility that it has for a person in a community. That knowledge is practiced and it's kept alive. Um, the particular process that we've uh, talked about, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about braiding knowledge. Um, uh, elders talk about um, uh, the, the other methodologies, two-eyed seeing uh, and, and others. Uh, but uh, what my late father describes in uh, the book that Janelle had mentioned is this idea about biculturalism, bringing, combining knowledges from Western science and from traditional knowledge, taking the best of two worlds. A form of that biculturalism is what we call uh, cultural monitoring. And that's further described in the Bison Report. But it's basically what we are doing in the uh, bull trout study, as well as the, uh, the cutthroat trout study that is, uh, we are currently involved in, uh, in the Kananaskis region of uh, Southwest Alberta. Um, there are a number of steps there that we take. Um, the very first step is the ceremony. And the video that we showed is our trip going into uh, Pinto Lake, or Harhanshi Wapte Imne. And that is to uh, conduct or start our study by first going to these places and starting off in the right way. So that ceremony afterwards is when we held those interviews. We could have done interviews anywhere. We could have come here or go to a hotel or a gymnasium and done interviews. We go to the places that are culturally important landscapes to talk to elders. That way, they're relaying information not just about themselves, maybe stories or instances that happened when they were younger or relatives they had heard from. All of those memories come flooding back when they actually physically go to these places. Uh, Elder Charlie and Elder John Wesley 
who are pictured in the video, they haven't been up to Pinto Lake in about 20 years. So when we arranged for the helicopter to go up there last October, they were overjoyed just to be back there in, in that time. They can't ride anymore. They can't, there's no real physical way for them to get there other than to fly. So projects like these really provide a really nice opportunity to bring our community back to these uh, culturally important places. Um, just the, the last thing I guess I'd like to share, uh, this is our cultural monitoring process that we're following uh, through this uh, process. Um, and we, you know, we want to thank all of the Stony Dakota elders and knowledge keepers that have come. Uh, it's a very uh, rugged landscape where we travel to and we're uh, hoping to continue to travel uh, to these areas so that we can uh, further capture the knowledges uh, of not just bull trout, but, you know, plant species, uh, terrestrial and avian species as well. In many communities, like we heard uh, this morning uh, down in South Africa and other places, uh, language is tied to the land, land is tied to the language. In this case, we have a pristine, uh, ecologically important landscape, but we also have the language still. So really important to capture this kind of information while both of those things are still intact. Uh, Ishnish, thank you. Uh, we we sort of took up time for questions. So if you have questions at the end, we'll stick around to, for to chat. Okay. Oh, we have five minutes. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay, oh, right on. <laughs> I think he's coming with the mic, right? I think you said you have a question there. It's just a comment. Yeah. Okay. I guess we answered everything. <laughs> As you can imagine, there's endless things to talk about on a project like this. So we, you know, we were, you know, trying to be as decisive as possible. I guess um, if if there aren't any questions, uh, one last thing I'd just like to share is that um, we don't have a lot of these uh, uh, cultural studies on uh, uh, important uh, uh, threatened species or endangered species. So when we have decision makers like government trying to decide on what areas to protect or setting in a management plan, they're deriving all of those plans based on Western science reports. So the more that we can get more uh, First Nations or Indigenous groups to collaborate and to work on these types of cultural studies, hopefully we can add to a foundation where government can then say, yes, this is a set of mitigations or recommendations that we can include in the management plan. So we're not doing just business as usual. We're adapting to what the concerns are for uh, local Indigenous groups. I think an example of what Bill's talking about is uh, catch and release fishing. So in that sort of first wave of fishery science where they realized that bull trout were threatened, um, that you, you, you know, they'd now become a fish that is catch and release. But according to Sony Nakoto wisdom, you should never do that to a fish. It's disrespectful. Um, and so that's one of the outcomes we're hoping from our project is um, we're actually creating a museum exhibit that will talk about that component to try to, you know, encourage people to rethink the catch and release process. Um, but also in this region, this is what we call crown land in Canada, um, you know, public lands. And um, it's in the foothills of the Rockies. Uh, people come on mass from the cities and weekends and party, um, take their holiday trailers and uh, uh, off highway vehicles. And um, they tear apart the, the spawning grounds of these fish. Um, logging also, there's a heavy logging in the region. It's, um, you know, mostly coniferous forest. And so, yeah, the, the logging also uh, dramatically alters the temperatures of these stream beds that need to be cold for the bull trout. So uh, one of our ideas in this concept of restoring instead of restoring bull trout is that we're, we're trying to gently 
get people thinking about the fish um, and their behavior and relationships with them without telling people that they can't drive their quads in the stream beds and, you know, because it's such a politically contentious region. So that's kind of an underlying way that we're trying to, you know, expose people to elders teachings and, and get them to think about the fish in a different way. Yeah, Andrew. Oh, I was just going to say that um, the, uh, the other part of this research too, is to look at uh, not just uh, bull trout, but uh, wildlife in general as uh, under better understanding uh, key indicators of climate change on particular, whether it be a watershed or a waterway or even a landscape. Um, it's only been about 200 years since we've removed bison from landscapes and we can see a lot of the changes that have happened in grasslands, for example. We don't understand all of those changes on waterways. So by protecting these waterways with bull trout, cutthroat trout, native species, we can then further understand um, water quality, water quantity issues. So uh, hopefully that's what will come out of these types of cultural studies, but um, hard to make those connections between you know, understanding the wildlife versus making policy changes. Uh, Andrew? Yes, um, not all types of uh, fish were smoked. A lot of them were just prepared and uh, over the fire. Uh, but yes, the, the, those are these are some of the processes that we are coming to understand how they were preserved, what they were used to preserve other foods and other medicines. So, uh, still more work that we need to do on our part for Stony Lakota. But people did go to Pinto Lake in that stream and, and collect fish right every fall um, in the, what they, uh, what is it, the the moon of the changing leaves? Yes. Um, is They would camp there. And so, um, again, that ceremony that's required there to keep the fish abundant and that harvesting fish, those are all parts of the relationship that's necessary to um, continue the, you know, the abundance of the fish. Yeah. But thanks, Bill. I'll, I'll introduce Andrew next. <laughs> Oh. So our, our next paper is called Stretching Labor and Care in Dense Bosnian Home Gardens. And it, um, our presenters are Andrew Flax and Ashley Glenn. Yay. <laughs> 